I'm with Daniel from Energy Fuels. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? You've been with Energy Fuels since 2013, and Jack Lipton tells me you are the best kept secret at Energy Fuels. <laughs> <laughs> he says you make most of the decisions about targeting the right projects. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, some kind words from Jack. Uh, yes, uh, over the last you know few years, as we as we've been building out this rare earth, um, you know, kind of company within Energy Fuels. Uh, yes, I've been, you know, kind of involved uh, in all the acquisitions on the heavy mineral sand side. So base resources, Astron, uh, the Donald project, and then working with our team out at White Mesa, um, for the development of, of that work on the separations and, and so forth. Okay. So let's back you up then. So for instance, I know what happens to me. I'm inundated with projects all the time. And of course, Energy Fuels is a leader in the industry. You must have deal flow coming in. I mean, how are you handling your deal flow right now? Right. And, and so we get it on both the uranium side and the rare earth side. Uh, you know, uranium is a bit more of the hot commodity at the moment, but uh, rare earths are kind of coming back. Yeah. At, at the beginning, when we first got into this, the, the, the phone kind of never stopped ringing. And we had to learn pretty early on that there are projects that, merit a bit more investigation and projects that you just kind of have to listen to the people and then, you know, politely decline because you can't investigate all of them. Uh, as we've matured a bit more in the rare space, that's become easier. We know what to look for. We know what to question right away. We know how to kind of handle, um, you know, people that just kind of come out of the woodwork who think they have the best project in the world. And, you know, sometimes you have to kind of let them down a bit. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's been a lot, um, you know, on the, the heavy mineral sand front with Toliara and, uh, Donald, we, we think we got two of the best. And so we're, we're pretty excited about those projects, but we're always evaluating more and the, the phone still rings. So it, it's a regular part of my day. Well, I know your phone still rings. I actually <laughs> was contacted by a country that wanted me to bring their projects to you. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, you've given me 70 projects. Can you narrow <laughs> it down? Right? Because I can't just send you all 70 projects and expect you to review them all. So sure. what kind of wisdom? I said, you know, maybe give me a two pager and pick your top three. But can you give me more specifics on how if, if I was the perfect project for you? Okay. Yep. How would I get your attention in an email? What information would you be looking for? And you can give us some of the, the, the hot uh, targets that you're looking at right now, sure. if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the, the key, the key thing for the, the rare earth side is that it's monazite. That that's our, our mineral that we want to be processing is monazite. Two is that it has to contain uranium. You know, we process this all through our facility at White Mesa which we are licensed to recover uranium from. And so any any feed that we take, we have to recover uranium from that feedstock. So if it's monazite, it tends to have uranium in it, um, but we'd like to know the quantity. So those two those two key points, you know, that'll get my attention. Um, if you come to me and say, you've got a rare deposit, but you don't know what the mineralogy is, you know, I might go look on that myself, but it's, it's not gonna move to the top of the pile. So one monazite, two uranium. Okay. And you were talking about two projects that you're most excited about, including Donald. Can you give us a little bit more information about how the process of selecting those two projects, how it actually happened? I think our, our viewers sure. would really enjoy that. Sure. And, and so these are heavy mineral sand projects that have monazite, which is the rare earth bearing mineral that we're, we're interested in. Uh, but it also has a number of other payables, which are the ilmenite uh, rutile, which are titanium bearing minerals and zircon, which is a zir zirconium bearing mineral. And we're not heavy mineral sand miners. We're, we're uranium folks, you know, that's our background. My background is uranium, you know, Mark, our CEO, he's a uranium guy. And so we went out and we hired uh, TZMI, who is the kind of global industry leader in, in um, kind of the, the heavy mineral sand business, uh, as far as marketing research, uh, project research. And we asked them to put together a list for us uh, of the best heavy mineral sand projects in the world that contain monazite. They provided that to us. We started to winnow that down. Some had 
connections to China that we weren't necessarily interested in, in pursuing those. Some were with companies that had too big of a market cap or, or that was their kind of main business. And so we knew that they wouldn't be divesting those assets. And so we really kind of identified more of the junior space or these undeveloped projects in kind of whether it was Australia or, you know, a slightly more risky jurisdiction in Madagascar where there might be options to, to go either acquire or JV these projects. And so we narrowed it down to about 10, um, kind of picked our five or six favorite of those 10 and then started the process. We kind of traveled the world, talking to people, talking to the owners of the projects, visiting the projects. Um, and at the end of the day, we, we think we ended up with the two best heavy mineral sand projects that contain monazite, which are Toliara in Madagascar and, and Donald in Australia. Now, my CMI board sent me a note. They said that you've got to do a modeling process with this. Is that correct? Uh, modeling as far as economics or as far as resources? Uh, both. Yes. Both. Um, so luckily, both of these projects had been to the feasibility stage, which made them a bit more attractive to us. Is you know, they'd been drilled out. We knew what was there. And so the modeling on the resource had been done by third parties. So, you know, something very easy to review. I'm a geologist by background. I don't know if I've mentioned that, but and I've done a lot of resource modeling in, in my career. So being able to get those models and review the resource, knowing that, you know, the material is actually in the ground, seeing the drill results and, and you know, quantifying that and then taking that information and taking the feasibility studies and really kind of applying their numbers to what, you know, Energy Fields as the corporation wanted to kind of see and how that flows through what, you know, our White Mesa mill and see the oxides that we can produce from that for the rare earths and see the overall kind of economic picture. We know that these projects have kind of standalone economics, but we wanted to see how this flows through on a corporate level. And, you know, we're very excited with the results that we were seeing, um, you know, because the, the heavy mineral sands offset some of our costs on the monazite production. And we think that kind of in turn will make us a low cost uh, rare earth oxide producer globally. And so, you know, really being able to model that and, and see the results kind of really allow us to drive to the conclusion that this is the way we want to go. Okay. So if I understand correctly, your priority really is the monazite, but it's got to have uranium. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So like I, I mentioned, um, all of our feedstock that we process through the White Mesa mill has to have recoverable uranium associated with that. And so typically we like to see, you know, where most people are afraid of uranium, the more the better for us. Uh, we typically like to see kind of the 50 to 100 ppm range at the low end, but anything above that is kind of extra that, you know, because we're processing this material, recovering the uranium, and that's, a, that's an extra product that we can sell. So not only are we recovering the rare earths, we have this kind of added, added benefit of the uranium. So, of course, with the technology processes, you're also in charge of that. Is that correct? Uh, most of our, our processing comes out of uh, Logan Shumway, who's our, our mill manager, and he's really kind of the, the brains behind the what we've accomplished uh, to date with the rare earth processing. Have there been any surprises in this process since you started uh, uh, extracting rare earths as well? I think the biggest surprise to me has been how smoothly it's gone. You know, when we got into the space in about 2020, you know, it's basically, you know, we're trying to duplicate what China is doing with monazite. And so everyone told us outside of China, you can't process monazite economically. The people don't exist. The, the knowledge doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so you're going to have a really hard time doing this. You know, our guys at White Mesa kind of took that as a challenge and said, why can't we do it? And, you know, from, you know, our first crack and leach runs to the production of our mixed rare earth carbonate that we are selling to NEO through, you know, separated oxides, NDPR, and now T, or the DY that we announced last week, you know, it, it's been about as smooth as it can go. There have been some hiccups, of course, but, you know, the team out at White Mesa has done an excellent job of, you know, kind of learning this and building this from the ground up and, you know, really, you know, making this a worthwhile endeavor for us. You know, if they couldn't process it, we wouldn't be in this position right now. And, and I just can't give them enough credit. Of course, when I was asking about any surprises, is there anything like a surprise critical mineral that pops out while you're doing your rare earth uh, processing? Um, I don't think anything in particular. I think it's always kind of interesting when people call and ask what, what we're willing to produce or what 
um, you know, they might see as a critical mineral. We get a lot of calls on, on, oh, you guys are doing rare, so you guys, do you guys have gallium? Well, no, we don't have gallium. We don't have germanium. But, you know, we do have the full suite of rares. We're looking at producing NDPR, TB, and DY. Could we produce more? Sure. It's just the economics might not be there to do it at the at this time. So we are looking at all all critical minerals that come along with our feedstocks, but you really have to evaluate the economics before you can produce any of them. So Daniel, um, it, it, have you had a lot of other companies approach you about their monazite and processing their ore? Yes, we've had a number of discussions over the last five years about um, you know monazite that exists at other projects throughout the world. Um, you know we are. kind of constantly in discussions with people. At the end of the day, we're looking to fill about 60,000 tons of feed into our phase one and phase two plants at White Mesa. With the project we currently have, we have about 40,000 tons of that filled. So we are in constant discussions and would be open to uh, receiving feedstocks if they're the appropriate feedstock uh, to fill up that excess capacity. And then I'd also like to ask you, since you've been with Energy Fuels, what is your favorite thing about Energy Fuels that you wish more people would talk about? Um, I mean, my favorite thing is I like how dynamic we are, um, you know, how open we are. We can I can walk down the hall, talk to our CEO. I can walk down the hall, talk to our CFO. You know, we can we can put a plan together probably way quicker than than most big companies can. Um, you know, I, I like that we were willing to take the risks to do this. Most people would say, well, you know, the uranium market has boomed. You could have just stayed in uranium and, and made a killing. Sure. But, you know, we see this as diversifying our asset base, you know, so when if there's a lull or a downturn in uranium, we have heavy minerals or rare earths to kind of support the company. And so I just think that that ability to take a risk and that ability to be dynamic is, is really what makes Energy Fuels kind of an exciting company to work for. So Energy Fuels is the number one producer for American uranium, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And, and we're really excited with what we've been producing out of our Pinion Plain mine. And we're planning to, to turn the mill on for uranium production in October. And, you know, I think we're planning on producing, you know, about 250,000 pounds of uranium per month. And so we're really excited about that, you know, over the next, you know, eight to 12 months. And how will this position you for producing rare earths? And which rare earths will you be prioritizing? So we see the uranium as a way to fund The build out of our rare earth plan. And so we have to build out two mines. We have to build out the two we've talked about, Toliara in Madagascar and, and Donald in Australia to produce the rare earth minerals we need to process at the mill. And so by being able to generate revenue from our uranium sales, that offsets some of the, you know, the, the debt or equity we would need to, to build out those projects. We also need to build out the phase two rare earth facility at White Mesa. And as soon as that's up and running along with those mines, you know, we're really looking at producing NDPR oxide, TB and DY oxide. And the, the quality of our monazite feed gives us kind of a, a leg up on kind of the global competition for, for the heavy rares, which are the TB and the DY. So we see that kind of as being our differentiator on the rarer side of things. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for your time today. And for everybody interested in finding out more about energy fuels, please go to the following website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy.